the diver hadn't made a mistake. Teroese volitans, or lionfish, is a scorpionfish indigenous to the Pacific and Indian Oceans that did in fact travel to the Atlantic coast of the United States at the end of the 20th century. In its native habitat, the lionfish is just a predator amongst many, but here in the Atlantic, it has become the terror of the sea. It devours everything in its path, even the youngest of fish. It feeds on the larvae of shrimp and lobster. In the mangroves or in the reefs, it gobbles up its fellow predators before they're big enough to attack it. Marine life suffers wherever the lionfish flourishes, and the tropical reefs are quickly becoming deserted. In 10 years, the lionfish has conquered a massive territory at a horrifying speed. Scientists call it the worst invader on the planet. How did the lionfish arrive in the Atlantic? Its natural habitat is thousands of miles away. The answer can perhaps be found off the coast of North Carolina, three hours by boat from the Beaufort Research Center. Dr. James Morris from the National Ocean Service has thoroughly studied Teroese volitans. This fisherman's son has taken the matter of the lionfish to heart. Dr. Morris and his team of volunteers are on the way to the wreck of the Neko to capture a large number of living specimens. This way he can continue to study the species in his laboratory and hope to solve the mystery of this invasion. So we're here on a, a, a shipwreck a diving site here off the coast of North Carolina. And this is a site that we've been collecting a number of lionfish over the years. These fish that, we're bringing, that the divers are bringing up today, we're going to be using for research at our laboratory. The Neko is a German cargo ship that sank over 100 years ago in the Gulf Stream, the current that forms in the Caribbean Sea and moves up towards the North Atlantic. James Morris's volunteers must be able to handle the strength of the current. In North Carolina, the Gulf Stream is practically an underwater river running along the coast at a speed of six to 10 miles per hour. If a diver gets caught in the current, he will miss the wreck and may find himself stranded amongst the bull sharks that circle the zone. The warm waters of the Gulf Stream are ideal for underwater life. James Morris sends his team to dive around the Neko regularly because he knows that they will find many lionfish, particularly big ones. Thanks to the abundant food, many specimens in the area reach the species' maximum size, about 16 inches. But don't be fooled by its size. Teroese volitans is the dominating species around the Neko. With each passing day, it leaves less and less room for its competitors. Although the lionfish is not a good swimmer, it's difficult to capture it alive without hurting it. Diving at a depth of 145 feet is a considerable strain on the heart and the body. The divers must therefore economize their energy in order to avoid tiring too quickly. They must also watch out for the fish's poison spines. The sting is extremely painful, and the suffering is so intense that it can provoke a serious diving accident with terrible consequences. The team has captured 30 specimens. This should be enough for the laboratory. 
It's now time to surface, because at this depth, the oxygen gets used up very quickly. These dives seldom last more than a half hour. Back on the boat, the captured fish are immediately transferred to a tank containing seawater. That's a good haul, that one. Yeah. Big, old, big female here. Mm. There's a big difference in pressure between the depths and the surface. The fish haven't had time to decompress, and their bellies are swollen with air. To keep them alive, James Morris pierces their swim bladder with a hollow needle. The air is able to escape, and the fish quickly returns to normal. Back at the Beaufort Research Center, James Morris transfers the fish into pools filled with continually recycled seawater. This will be their temporary home. Several of the fish captured at the Neko wreck are dissected the very next day. Their DNA will be analyzed. The systematic comparative analysis of the DNA of all the lionfish collected in this region of the Atlantic should lead the research team back to the original strain. They'll then be able to understand how the species arrived here and to locate where the invasion began. Marking them in terms of... Professor Thomas Schultz, a geneticist at Duke University in North Carolina, has been in charge of this study since the lionfish first appeared in the area. So using the genetic tools and these molecular markers that we're seeing here, these genetic polymorphisms, one of the things that we're hoping to be able to tell is how many fish were originally introduced into the east coast of the United States. So, you know, when you look at two fish and they look morphologically to be very similar, you can't distinguish whether or not those fish came from the same parents or not. And so using these genetic polymorphisms, we can actually look at the amount of genetic diversity that's present in these invading populations and try to track back to see what's the minimum number of fish that were introduced into the United States initially. Genetics research shows that we have a, a very few number of lionfish that were introduced into the Atlantic, um, probably fewer than 10 was introduced into the United States, likely from the aquarium trade. It is a very popular aquarium species that is imported into the U.S. from um, Indonesia, from the Philippines. Uh, we know that many thousands of lionfish have been imported into the United States in the last de decade. Thanks to the work done by Dr. James Morris and Professor Thomas Schultz, we now know how the lionfish arrived in the waters of the Atlantic. It all began in Florida at the end of the 20th century, during the 80s. In Miamis and Palm Beaches, famous luxury seafront apartments, exotic fish aficionados decided that their lionfish didn't really belong in the family aquarium. They didn't have the heart to kill them, so they released them into the nearby ocean waters below. The reason uh, lionfish were introduced is still not clear, and we know that is a bad idea. And there, have, there are many outreach campaigns and efforts to try to inform the public about the impacts of releasing your pets into the wild. One might assume that the specimens set free in Florida, so far from their natural habitat, would still stand little chance of surviving. Not only did they survive, but they multiplied at a startling rate and set out to conquer the Western Atlantic simultaneously on two fronts. In the south, near the Gulf of Mexico and the Bahamas. 
in the north near Georgia and near South and North Carolina. Once it had conquered the Caribbean and Central America, the lionfish found its way to South America. So there are many different aspects of lionfish life history and their biology and ecology that have really allowed this um, invasion to progress um, and for lionfish to become one of the most aggressive invaders on the planet.